Okay, thanks for sticking around. Um, thanks for the introduction. I'm going to be talking about um, some work we're doing to model and simulate the bacterial chemosensory array. Uh, I call it uh, computing the bacterial brain, and so hopefully that will be a, a more obvious analogy here soon. Um, so briefly, I'll start with a little bit of a background on bacterial chemotaxis, the chemosensory array, and why you know these things are interesting topics, um, and talk about some of the key challenges you know we've experienced and are currently experiencing with with looking at this system. Um, I'll go in then to some of the work we've done on Blue Waters already, uh, and some of the ongoing work, and then if there's time, you know, maybe look at some future directions for the project. So, in general, bacterial chemotaxis, um, so bacteria monitor a wide range of chemical concentrations, uh, and they use this to inform their modal behavior. And so, through the integration of many complex and often conflicting signals, uh, the cell is able to optimally uh, locate its uh, 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 or um, efficiently locate optimal growing conditions. So E. coli uses a, a deceptively simple run-tumble strategy um, in which it has two moves. It runs, uh, which is kind of a prolonged uh, straight line movement, or a tumble, which is um, uh, where it randomly reorients in kind of a sporadic way. And so in the absence of a gradient, this results in a random walk. And so you have interspersed runs and tumbles, and uh, the cell just forages uh, randomly. However, in the presence of an attractant uh, or a repellent, I'm showing an attractant gradient here, um, this random walk becomes biased, and the net propagation of the cell is such that you get closer uh, to the source of the attractant. And so I'm showing a couple videos here of this phenomenon. So this is a on the left is a rather famous video from the Berg lab showing um, you know, E. coli cells undergoing this run-tumble run behavior uh, in 3D. And more recently, our collaborator at the University of Illinois uh, has optically immobilized single cells and can actually look at this run-tumble behavior um, in real time. So the bacterial brain. So uh, how do cells decide whether to run or tumble? This is part of what's controlled um, by the E. coli chemotactic network. Uh, and so this is an expanded set of molecules which basically help with the signal regulation and the coupling of two macromolecular complexes, uh, the flagellar motor and the chemosensory array, which is the, the subject of my research. And so these arrays are really quite large, so they contain tens of thousands of proteins, can occupy um, a significant portion of the cell surface area. And so what I'm showing on the left here is an atomic model which we've derived uh, in which I'll describe how it was um, derivated, you know, throughout the rest of the talk. Um, but what I'm showing on the right here, what's interesting about these um, proteins is that although the array is composed of just three types of proteins, a chemoreceptor, a histidine kinase key A, and a coupling protein key W, uh, all these proteins come together to form this rather elaborate and highly ordered a hexagonal lattice, and so you actually get the receptors trimerizing uh, to form trimers uh, of dimers, and then you get these rings of kinases and adapter proteins. And what this extended architecture does here is basically endow this network with enhanced information processing features. And so um, the array is ultra, well, the network is ultra sensitive, so cells can sense less than a 10 molecule change uh, per cell volume. Uh, in addition, high gain basically allows these cells to amplify these signals more than 50-fold. And uh, precise adaptation through the chemical modification of the receptors themselves extends the range of concentrations which the cell can respond to sensitively to over five orders of magnitude. So it's really um, a very s sophisticated uh, biocomputer. And so that's, like I said, that's where the, the brain comes in, while, although this is mechanical and as opposed to you know, electrochemical based. Uh, so why does this matter? Uh, so the array is a centerpiece, uh, or actually the E. coli chemotactic network is the most thoroughly studied sensory signal transduction system in biology. So as a, a centerpiece of that network, um, you know, um, a molecular perspective uh, would represent, uh, you know, a, a great step forward towards the basic under a basic understanding of the biological information processing of proteins. Um, in addition, evolution determined that this was, was quite a nice solution because it's uh, in all organisms and all microbes uh, visualized to date uh, using electron microscopy, uh, this 
network or this um, extended lattice is universally conserved. So, you know, we hope this will provide some transferability, you know, between the functional mechanisms of distantly related species. Uh, and finally, because, you know, this is a microbial phenomenon, the, a lot of the proteins involved in making this happen aren't present in mammalian sources. So, um, perhaps, I'm sorry, perhaps uh, um, an understanding of the molecular underpinnings may be able to lead to a reprogramming of sorts and the development of novel uh, antibiotics. So some of the challenges we face. So, so the goal is basically uh, to construct a high fidelity, uh, fully atomistic model of the chemosensory array for use with molecular dynamics to study signal transduction. Uh, we also want to get at the, the, the cooperativity between these, these proteins. And so uh, the first challenge is that uh, for this system, is more system dependent. For this system, structural um, information is limited. So we do have high resolution structures of some of the proteins, um, but these are often incomplete. Um, because they're soluble, they're not in their array bound conformations, and uh, that data is local. Uh, to offset that, we do have uh, electron microscopy images, as I showed in a previous slide, of the extended complex. However, these uh, resolutions are much lower, uh, normally around 25 nanometers, which is not uh, enough to unambiguously assign, you know, particular portions of a density to a certain protein or a domain. Uh, so a solution here is uh, multi-scale modeling techniques with VMD and NAMD, which I'll describe again uh, in more detail. Um, the other is that the array is, is large, is necessarily large. Um, like I said, because we wanted to get at some of this cooperativity, uh, we need um, the collective interactions of many parts. We need to we need to simulate many of these proteins. In addition, because um, the existing ex experiments looking at signaling in single proteins uh, show minute structural and dynamical changes, uh, an atomistic detail is required to to really get at some of the finer details of these mechanisms. And so, what I'm showing here is is a colored uh, tomogram of the pole of an E. coli cell. And so, you can see here the the array. Um, versus, you know, say the, the ribosome, which was kind of a state of the art, you know, uh, a little less than 10 years ago uh, in terms of, um, you know, running um, uh, high performance computing simulations. Okay. So I'll talk. So the latter issue was solved, uh, or solution is uh, NAMD on Blue Waters. And so um, this, you know, largely has nothing to do with me. Uh, um, so it was great that um, a, a team of developers at uh, the University of Illinois have put years into developing um, this software and the head developer being in the audience here. But uh, NAMD supports a wide range of uh, user-defined forces, a suite of enhanced sampling and free energy methods. Um, recently, we've added interfaces to ORCA and MOPAX to, to enable uh, hybrid QM molecular mechanics simulations. Uh, and now NAMD is on the cloud, so uh, you can run simulations through Amazon. Um, the latest release is, it's of course, open source, so you can download it uh, at our uh, uh, TCBG website. And so, um, you know, what the take home, I guess, here is so these are some benchmarks from our recent. Uh, um, PRAC proposal, and so you see that NAMD uh, is able to efficiently um, scale for systems of a wide range of sizes, so all the way up to the HIV caps, it was just 64 million atoms or so, down to much smaller systems, but that might be able to use enhanced sampling uh, techniques in many, many instances of the simulations in order to take advantage of the, the highly parallel nature of, of blue waters. Uh, and so for this particular system here, the 20 million atom array, uh, you can get about 36 nano six, uh, nanoseconds a day on 2,046 XK nodes. So that's what we're looking at for that system. So in terms of actually building the thing, um, this is where some of the multi-scale modeling techniques come in. And so, as I said, we have high res resolution structures of, of portions of some of these proteins. And so, you know, we have uh, the cytoplasmic portion of the receptors as a trimer, uh, but not any of the um, um, the higher uh, parapla uh, cytoplasmic portion. Um, we also have portions of part of the kinase and then uh, actually a full structure of the monomer. Um, and from these, uh, using existing structural information, we can actually build up um, models of these kind of core complexes. 
And so, uh, so you see here the key W only ring, the key A, key W ring, and then the trimer of dimers. And so this is shown from the top here, of course. But um, we, even though this, this, as I said, this is, is very quite local, and so we want to know how to put these together to form this kind of more extended hexagonal array. And so, and to do that, we need more information. And so, this is um, work that was done in collaboration with Pei Jun Zhang, is, is now at Oxford, uh, formerly at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, but she devised a way to basically deposit the key signaling proteins on lipid monolayers. And so, the details of that are pretty technical, but uh, the take home is, is that it was ideal for electron microscopy. Uh, it, prov it provided thin, crystalline, and well defined samples. And so using uh, subtomogram classification and averaging, uh, they were actually able to, to resolve um, 3D density maps of the extended array architecture. Uh, and the one I'm showing here was, um, uh, was processed and, and obtained by Ben Himes uh, in her lab, in Pei Jun Zheng's lab, and uh, came in at just a little above uh, 11 angstroms. And so while this is still not uh, resolved enough to give us, you know, an unambiguous placement of these proteins and their conformations, uh, combined with the, the oligomer models uh, uh, previously described, we can, can basically synthesize this information using uh, a technique called molecular dynamics flexible fitting. And so I'll show a movie of that process, but basically what's happening is, is that uh, we're using a, uh, the map itself to derive a potential, which is being applied in the molecular dynamic simulations in order to drive the conformations of those proteins towards that represented in the experimental data. And so, you know, this atomic model uh, um, reproduces, refines, and also identifies novel interactions at these key protein-protein interfaces. Um, and so, uh, this model we deposited in the PDB, and so hopefully if you're interested, you know, download it and test it, break it, you know, improve it. And so now that we have a model, we wanted to go ahead and, and see what we could learn from it. And so this is, um, you know, the trimer model I showed, it, it's, a, it's a minor um, rearrangement to get the actual fundamental unit cell of the array. And so doing that, we can um, use periodic boundary conditions to simulate um, a bulk array. And so uh, our strategy was to basically, after a long equilibration, to, to split um, simulations off you, with a new seed to get, uh, you know, to enhance the, the statistics. And so we ran um, on the uh, nine half microsecond simulations of this uh, unit cell system. And so this is what one of those simulations looks like. Um, and so here I'm showing a top view and you can kind of see uh, faded out the, the periodic boundary conditions. And so this is the data that we want to make sense of. So one of the interesting things we saw in this in these simulations uh, was the reoccurrence of this conformational change in the kinase of uh, the kinase domain of the histidine kinase, and so I'll show a movie of that here. But basically, uh, you'll see as you progress, uh, one of these um, catalytic domains actually dips below the rest, and it changes uh, some fundamental contacts between the receptor. Uh, and the kinase as well as some inter-domain uh, connections. And so we were wondering if this might not be uh, a way of communicating between the receptor and the, uh, the kinase. And so what I'm showing here is just a graph um, of looking at the kinases in all nine of those simulations. And this is the first principal component, so it's just monitoring kind of um, the conformation of these. And so we see we have uh, uh, three or four dips here, one of which returns to the bulk, the other three um, don't, you know, throughout the simulation. So we asked what was different about these uh, simulations. So we used uh, um, RMSD-based K-metoids clustering to basically assign the conformations of these various uh, kinases uh, to classes. And so we came up uh, with, with four classes. Two of them were dominated by this this undipped key A dimer, which we obtained from the MDFF. Uh, but this other separate class was well occupied, which was the, uh, what we called the dipped key A dimer. And so the strategy here was basically then to pick pairs of residues that were unique to either class. And so we could, you know, potentially disrupt salt bridges or stabilize via cross-linking 
um, the different classes of structures. So we did that, so we went back, um, based on the predictions of MD, we went back to Pejun, um, and Francis Alvarez and her lab um, conducted these experiments, but we looked at uh, swim assays and cross-linking basically to see, you know, that the residues um, we showed to be um, near each other and important for e the individual classes were, were actually able to cross-link and that affecting them did affect chemotaxis and that was seen to be the case uh, for both classes of structures. Um, and so it, it helped to validate our model and it also showed that uh, this um, less occupied but dipped uh, state is actually being sampled in native cells um, in E. coli. Okay. So, you know, the, the motivation then after that is, you know, how might this affect KA activity? So that's something our experiments couldn't uh, discern. And, you know, in that case, how might the receptors be, you know, regulating uh, this particular motion? And so these are still questions we're, we're looking at and looking into. Um, so very quickly, some the current work we're working or uh, moving towards. Uh, so what I've shown you is on this kind of cytoplasmic portion, you know, we, where we used the existing structural information, but you know, we really want the whole transmembrane receptor. And so uh, my recent work has been to basically synthesize the existing um, uh, receptor structural data to come up with an uh, um, intact transmembrane model of a of a chemoreceptor from E. coli. And so um, we were able to do this uh, using an explicit X-ray, or for the serine receptor uh, is, is the one of interest. We were able to do this using an explicit X-ray structure for the paraplasmic uh, domain, um, some homology modeling for this HAMP domain, and um, cross-linking efficiencies between various helices of the uh, transmembrane domain. Um, we placed that in a PLP, uh, PLPE, PLPG lipid bilayer to mimic the inner membrane of E. coli, uh, and then uh, you know equilibrated the full receptor. And so actually, this atomic model uh, reproduces the cross-linking distances and the lipid protein interactions that are known from the literature, uh, as well as it, sh it sheds light on key residues um, at the various interfaces between these domains uh, and mechanical properties of the of the receptor that we're we're still investigating further. And so, yeah, so combining that model of the full uh, membrane-bound serine receptor with homology models of the E. coli proteins, you know, we can actually derive a full uh, model of this fundamental signaling unit from the E. coli array. And so once you have this, you know, it's, it's a relatively simple matter to obtain uh, as large an array as, as you need for, for the questions you want to ask. So, yeah, in summary, um, we use cryo-electron tomography to determine the 3D um, structure of the E. coli chemosensory array in high detail. Um, based on this data, we were able to integrate um, this, this lower or intermittent resolution data with the high resolution crystal structures that exist, um, as well as some novel modeling to, to produce the first atomic models of an intact chemoreceptor and a transmembrane chemosensory array. Um, and this, so we extended simulations on blue waters and allowed us to um, identify uh, a novel conformational change in one of the key signaling proteins of the array, uh, which we validated, you know, further with uh, exper uh, experiments in uh, uh, native cells and mutant cells as well. So with that, I want to thank um, Amat de Korshid and Zan Scholten, who are overseeing the research now, uh, the late Professor Klaus Scholten, who uh, allowed me to, uh, to begin and explore here as well as the entire uh, TCBG group at U of I, uh, Pejun's lab, including Ben Himes and Dr. Uh, Francis Alvarez, and Sandy Parkinson at the University of Utah, and, and of course, uh, Blue Waters and NCSA for uh, the PRAC resources that have made this work possible. So, thanks. <laughs>